Well, how are we doing? Right, this week's question comes in from Physio. He's an uh, anatomy motion therapist, as am I. Um, and I believe he's now qualifying as a strength conditioning coach, which is good. Um, Ricardo, Ricardo, I'm going to butcher this last name. Galliotti, all the way down in Australia. And Ricardo says, hey, Dave. One question about training young kids how quick and fast should they start with weight sets and duration thinking more about growth plates etc regards ricardo and ricardo that is a question and you know what um first off just apologize for the lighting a little bit i'll do my best with the lamp here um very very bright behind me um ricardo Growth plates, ah, oh, this is this myth that's been going around for as long as I can remember. I actually think my parents might have even said it to me. Lifting weights stunts your growth. Now, I didn't start lifting until I was 16, but I was still growing at 16. Did it stunt my growth? Well, I'm a touch under six foot two, so I'm going to say no. That's an N equals one. But anyway, it's it's a myth that's been around for an awful long time. It's been disproven over and over again. And just a little while ago, I was asked to train my kids' hurling team, a group of under-15s at the time. And I didn't hesitate. Did not hesitate. Had them lifting. Had them lifting weights on day one. Safely, effectively. Focus on technique. You know what I mean? Day one. Not an issue. We had the best season going. Um, so anyway. All right, so should kids lift? Yes. Is it dangerous for them? No. Does it stunt their growth? No. Does it damage the growth plates? Not usually. In short... Right? Ah, no, I'll just read that out. You can read that on the blog if you want to read it out. Um, da, 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 growth plates, growth plates. Right, basically, right, okay, look. There's a lot of myths around strength and conditioning. It is still a new science. Sports science is not that old. There's a lot of stuff that has come about. Think of... Knees aren't allowed to go past toes. Load of nonsense. Right? Anybody with any common sense knew that was nonsense. Um, this anti-flexion, this the spine isn't meant to flex idea. Again, nonsense. Anybody with common sense knows it's nonsense. Now, I know I am biased in that my background, I grew up in martial arts, where... Knees going past toes was a daily occurrence. Spines flexing under load, load of another body, is just a daily occurrence. It's what we do. And you know what? Yeah, a lot of bad martial artists have bad backs and bad hips, bad knees. It ain't because of those positions, because I did all those positions. My back, knees, hips are fine. Right? People who do good strength training strengthen the joints and the muscles and the tendons and the ligaments and blah, 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 expose themselves to load, become more durable. So that when you get to these positions that happen in athletic circumstances, whether it's on the field, on the mat, in the ring, wherever you happen to be, even on the hillside, the mountainside, your body's just a bit more durable. Um... When we're talking about growth plates, I had a buddy in secondary school who had one underdeveloped forearm. It was a half the size of his other one. Now, leave the teenage boy jokes aside there. What he'd done is he had broken his arm and he had actually damaged the growth plate. So it grew at a slower 
rate. He was warned that if he repeated that injury, there's a chance that arm would stop growing completely. That was an impact injury. It had nothing to do with strength training, weight training, anything like that. He was out in a chaotic environment where they're swinging tools around. Uh, I'll give you the backstory. I was part of Regia Anglorum, which is a medieval Medieval was a 10th century reenactment society. We dressed up as Norman soldiers and we would travel places and fight and reenact battles. Um, I'd show you my spear. My spe- I still have my spear. It's up in the front room. Um, but there's a scrub sack. In fact, in fact, this is the actual scrub sack I used back in the day. Yeah, that is an old Land Rover spring that has a antler handle. It is dull and the tip is rounded. These are for safety, but that is still a Land Rover spring. In here, it's probably well faded now, but for a number of years, I carried quite a good scar from this blade. This this blade, because I lent it to my buddy, and the two of us were sparring. He wanted to use this, which is which was much larger than his blade. I was using his. We were sparring away, and he clocked me right on the chin. All right, so even that blunt blade, that is, what is that? What is that? I reckon that's about three mil, three millimeters. I'm not translating that into American. Three millimeters. Civilized here. Um, but that will still split skin, break bone. That's small. There are larger, longer tools, swords, axes, etc. This here behind me, if you can see that, that is a scrum sax that my buddy Andrew Bellamy made. That is razor sharp. And above that is an axe that a Polish maker made for me, gifted to me by Seb. So, yeah, still involved in, in all the, the tools, the toys. But anyway, uh, my buddy Rab, I believe as a sword, cracked his arm. Now, that's impact. In the weight room, you're not really dealing with forces as acute as that. Yeah, there's impact. You could be doing jumps and plyometrics should be doing jumps and plyometrics. But if you're lifting a barbell, it moves a hell of a lot slower. Um, yeah, there's extreme instances of people breaking their wrists with kettlebells. Um, you're possibly more likely to get a dislocation than a natural break. We look at jumps and plyometrics. Well, that's what kids do anyway. You get a group of kids together in a room, in a playground, on a field. And pretty soon, you're going to witness kids running, jumping, chasing, changing directions. You had a ball or a puppy, and you'll see the intensity skyrocket. What's been the current, or what's been the, the strength condition recommendations for plyometrics up until recently? There's been a backlash against it more recently is you must have a one and a half times body weight back squat before embarking on a plyometric journey. Um, I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that. Again, myself and everybody else that's done martial arts, running, fell running, got into parkour, is uh, doing gymnastics. We're all jumping and bouncing from day one. And you know what you do? Just as you do in weight training, you don't start with a one and a half times back squat on your first day. You start with an empty bar. You might even start with something lighter than an empty bar. And you work up and you work up and you work up and you work up and you gradually build, build, build the load. 
guess what you can do with plyometrics? Two footed, just gentle little bounces. Very little load going through the body. You're fine. And you build and you build and build and build and build until you're doing big one legged hops. Do you know what I mean? Progressive resistance training that elicits specific adaptation to imposed demand. What more do you need to know to be a strength conditioning coach other than that? Um, for adults who are either non-athletic or returning to athletic training after a long period off, so for example, I'm 47. If I'd taken a 15, 20 year break away from training, if I'd have like been athletic through my teens and then gone into a career and then family, like most people do, and then at 47 now I decided to go back, then yeah, it would be a good idea to build strength first and get my squat up and do very, very light plyometrics. But as an adult, I don't have growth plate issues, but yeah, joints, etc. So let's get back to this here. So kids, safe to lift. Yeah course it is i reckon a kid jumping off a wall or out of a tree um playing a contact sports i know most of that stuff's banned in schools now but if they're playing bulldog or if they get into rugby hurling whatever else they're hitting and being hit with significant forces probably far exceeding what they're going to experience in the weight room so let's go through some We'll say Dave guidelines, and this is just my opinion. This this isn't set in stone, but something like if we've got peewees under eights, no external loaded needing, right? Kids this age, the games. They need to get down on all fours in quadrupedal drills. They need movement skills. They need tumbling, jumping, balance, coordination, and all that is best done through games. Old school kids' games that we that all those older generations played every day in the playground chase, um, tig or tag, scarecrow tig, where you get tagged and you freeze until somebody releases you. Um, we used to mimic each other, so one person would move and the other person would try and copy you. Um, we played bulldog, where you'd be running and grabbing almost rugby tackling each other. Um, all these games are brilliant for kids. Brilliant for kids. Um, you can make them a little bit more sports specific if you want. Quadrupedal, get them down on all fours. Build that coordination. Get them moving forward, backwards, left, right. Have them... Um, we used to do this quite a lot. You get a little tag, a little, little flag or something, like, a, like tag rugby, those little rip-off things, around the belt. Two people facing each other on all fours. And you first want to grab the tag off the other person who's the winner. Um, you want to see how it, well, you've got to keep them low, got to keep them on all fours as best you can. You're not allowed to stand up. But um, you, you want to see how well kids learn to move doing a simple game like that. Yeah, it's got to be fun. We get to 8 to 12 years old. They've moved on a little bit. Getting a little bit older, a little bit more mature, body weight strength now, push ups, pull ups, squats, all manner of lunges. Basic sort of gymnastics exercises. So, like tumbling, jumping, hopping, cartwheels, um, monkey bars, hanging off stuff. Um, it's this is where you get, again, keep it body weight coordination. Learning about this unit that they, they inhabit. 12 to 14. Again, again, these categories are broad strokes. You've, they, they don't put too much weight on these categories. But around about that early teenage years, it's, we, we start introducing external load. Why not? Technique-based. No need at all to focus on load. Right? They just need to get used to having load and moving external load this is where we start looking at getting a really good hinge a really good squat we can start doing some power variants like jumps like cleans like throws yeah 
but never stop doing bodyweight stuff, still have them roll and cartwheel and jump and push-ups and pull-ups and every manner of lunge. 15 plus, all bets are off. Let them go. Yeah? Load them up. Clean, squats, bent over rolls, bodybuilding work, powerlifting work, Olympic lifting work, whatever the coach is qualified to teach and whatever catches the kids fancy. I had a group of 15-year-olds who very few of them had lifted and those that had had done mostly bodybuilding type stuff. And within about three weeks, they're all doing cleans beautifully, hand cleans beautifully. And the lads that had a lifting experience mostly took longer to learn than the non-lifting guys because they had habits that developed. Um, but do you know what? It was glorious. It was glorious. And it was safe. And we progressed very carefully. And we had them watching each other's back. And do you know what that built? When they were watching each other's back, it built a camaraderie and a group mentality that was just amazing. Amazing. Kids lifting, kids should lift, especially to the teenage years. The, 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 the strength to weight ratio is off the charts when you're young. I envy it massively. Um, their hormone profile, especially in the teenage years, their testosterone levels are through the roof. They will recover and grow and adapt in a way that you will never once, never achieve as an adult without a bit of help. Yeah. Um, you know, a few supplements, we'll say. So, young kids, teach them to move well through games. Don't teach them your knee must be here and your back and, did, 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 and all the shit we go about, we, we talk to adults about. They're children. They're incredibly robust. They're flexible. They're mobile. They're not, they haven't gotten stiff yet. So keep them mobile and just help them learn their bodies. I can't reiterate enough. Games, challenges, little competitive stuff. How often in, in coming up through karate would we do stuff and we just keep going until somebody dropped out and then it'd all be a laugh and whatever else, or we do it as a competition. Yeah? We do speed challenges. You know, how many, you know, pair up and you'd, you'd have to do one push up each and then two push ups each and three push ups up to whatever number, 10, and then back down to one. Um, I think that works out 50 push ups. But you'd be in pairs and it'd be a race. And of course, the older lads and the higher grade lads would do it faster, but then the younger lads and the, the lower grades would see that and be chasing and pushing. Um, you know, when you get to that sort of 8 to 12, that young sort of pre-teen sort of age group, and I made a note here on the blog, um, I'll read it out. That 8 to 12 range is the time to keep them doing games. So any strength training should look like a combination of the world's strongest man, ninja warrior, and an 80s Jackie Chan training montage rather than structured, linear gym work. Plenty of time for that linear gym work later in the day, yeah, when they get a bit older. It doesn't need to be periodized, doesn't need to be structured. They need to learn, learn their body. Um, and I'll tell you now, in all the years I've worked with people, either as a professional coach or before that, doing occasional coaching and that, teaching martial arts, and um, which I've done pretty much my whole life, um, the easiest adults to train are the ones who had a background of training. Lads, um, lads, not just lads, but girls as well, that came up through martial arts, through dance, through gymnastics, became adults that were so easy to work with. They have a movement vocabulary. They might have 
forgotten it, but it's in them. It's like when you learn a bit of French in school and then you go away to France and you can sort of understand bits and pieces here and there, and then it comes back to you. Um, it's like if you... It's like your body remembers. It's in you. So kids that have trained, especially with large movement vocabularies, become great examples of human animals when they're older. Kids that train in very narrow movement vocabularies, well, they tend to be a bit broken up. They tend to be stiff. Oh, my knees are gone. Oh, my back's gone. Oh, I can't do this. Do you know what I mean? Whereas the guys with large movement vocabularies, they're unafraid. They can move still. Um, so if you're a coach dealing with young kids, with younger people, give them a large movement vocabulary and it will stand to them. It will stand to them. Yeah, you might see, you might not see the strength going up like you'd like it, but I'll tell you what, numbers on a bar do not translate to performance in the field correlates it's not causational it is correlational yeah yes somebody who has a bigger squat is likely to be faster yeah we know that but simply giving somebody a bigger squat isn't guaranteed to make them faster getting them faster will um yeah strength and performance go hand down of course they do but i think we put too much weight on it sometimes give them movement vocabulary create the potential Think of it like this. I like to think of the, the, the weight room as where we develop athletic potential. All right? It's not where we develop athleticism. It's where we develop the potential for athleticism. So if I develop your strength, your mobility, your endurance, and yeah, we can subsect all that down. But I make you stronger, more enduring, more mobile. Then you go out into your sport and you start learning to use that strength, use that mobility, use that endurance in your sport. Well, then we've increased your athletic potential. Yeah, you now have more strength available, you have more mobility available, you're going to be a bit faster, you're going to be a bit quicker. Now you have to refine that in the sport. That's where you become the athletic. Um, if we give the kids that early, we're creating a like we're creating a bigger potential bucket. If you like, we're going to build the bucket nice and big, and then we start filling it with the sports training, and then as they get older, more focus, strength, conditioning, et cetera, et cetera. And this bucket just keeps getting bigger. It can hold more ability. Yeah? Um, so that's basically my thoughts. Um, Ricardo, I'd love to hear your feedback on, on that. And if anybody else out there has questions or comments, well, you know what to do. You know how this YouTube thing works. There's a comment section below. Um, you can go on to DaveHedges.net and you could find the blog itself. I really should link it. I'm really bad at this kind of stuff. Um, and yeah, get in touch. Let me know. And if you have questions, if you have anything you want me to talk about, get in touch. We'll chat soon.